Good morning. Welcome. Our order of worship may be found at stephensth.org slash live. There you can also find a link to this week's children's moment. We will be gathering digitally for the foreseeable future, so we are grateful for your presence with us. And don't forget to check out faith15.com. This week, we explore human nature. Now, let us prepare for worship. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Kyrie. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. 
But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. God gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now, Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have ever said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. How shall I repay the Lord? I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord, O Lord, I am your servant. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the courts of the Lord's house. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. 
the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. We catch up with Jesus, who is healing feeling compassion for the leaderless people and saying to his followers, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's like Jesus is saying to his disciples, these people need people. Pray that God will send them what they need. And I like putting a pause there, like at the end of an episode, right? We put the words to be continued on the screen. An announcer, next week, we'll see if God shows up for them. Right? But part two, which begins at the beginning of chapter 10, begins with then, right? A strangely placed connecting word. He's telling the disciples to pray. Then he calls the disciples close for the plot twist. You go. Jesus is sending the disciples out to be God's grace, like the ancient predecessor to Margaret Mead. You be the change you want to see in the world. Now, we know this drill by now. We've seen it many times with Jesus. We've heard Paul call us the hands and feet of Christ. We know that we are how God is to be known here. So this revelation may not be so surprising for us to hear this morning. But what Jesus says next may be the bigger twist for us. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This command is abrupt. It goes against our instincts. We're used to Jesus sending us to the Samaritans and the outsiders, but here it's a mandate to work at home. Now it doesn't so much read like a command to avoid the rest, nearly as much as saying the sickness in the world is here in our house. 
even this in a way is not a shocking idea many want us to focus our attention on our neighborhood rather than on our world on the poverty in our closest streets rather than those many miles away but let's not mistake systemic problems for permanent ones jesus is not saying we should look close to home because that is always the best posture he says to them see i am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves because their own people in their own house are being wolves their leaders those chosen to protect the sheep are in fact killing them these sheep are being wolves now many of our siblings in faith are following jesus's mandate into the streets to find their sheep struggling in the midst of wolves let us look at our own house for wolf behavior in 1901 the 27-year-old george ward was accused of killing a white woman right here in terre haute and this fits the most common excuse for singling out young black men for punishment threatening white women ward was taken from police custody lynched and his body burned nobody was held responsible for that extrajudicial murder my friend matt larimer recently shared terre haute's redlining maps those maps of the city used to not only prevent minorities from buying property in certain parts of the city but also these maps influenced zoning ordinances he writes so that bars liquor stores and nightclubs could be built in racially integrated communities but not in white communities we must refuse to argue that it is just a few bad apples when the old saying reveals the danger rot poses to the whole racism is rooted in the economic systems public health systems and certainly the criminal incarceration system we too often frame our racism as a problem in the hearts and minds of individuals rather than the unjust systems themselves that a mob could lynch a man any man for any reason and feel justified is horrifying none of them were punished or that some benefit from having corruption or pollution in someone else's neighborhood a kind of unseen benefit that they didn't ask for personally but someone else engineered for people like them and other people are paying the price now and yet all of this is a past informing the cries of pain in the present we choose how we respond dietrich bonhoeffer reminds us that the parable of the good samaritan is a direct response to a question who is the neighbor a question asked by someone trying to avoid responsibility for justice so jesus responds with a parable about avoidance a parable that invites each of us to answer me i am the neighbor when someone is beaten who helps them each of us answers me i am the neighbor when someone can't breathe me i am the neighbor when someone is left to die by the side of the road me 
I am the neighbor. The gang that lynched and then burned George Ward in Terre Haute 119 years ago was full of people who called themselves Christians and claimed to follow Jesus. Supposedly good citizens, the kind of people few in town would ever call bad apples. But they joined in killing a man like the four men who together killed George Floyd in Minneapolis. Who is the neighbor? Me. Wrestling with systemic racism, injustice, all these wheels of oppression are confusing. We worry about offending each other, about getting political. We don't know what to say. And even if we did know what to say, we don't know what to do about it. It's funny that we always end up here, as if confusion about where to go next is some kind of natural end point or a legitimate option. Like wrestling with the sin of racism and the evils of systemic oppression is just so Ugh. Like deciding what we're going to have for dinner tonight. I mean, it's so hard. Sometimes we just can't even. We don't get to stay here. It's like getting our having a flat tire at a rest area and then saying, oh, I guess this is where we're going to live. Is there any wonder that Jesus' instructions are to go out there anyway? Like sheep in the midst of wolves, carrying nothing, no food or weapons, nothing to get to the second level of Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Just go. And not even with a prepared statement, no finely tuned mission statement, no expertly crafted list of demands, nothing poll tested as not to offend the people you hope to convince. Just go. And when it's time to speak, you'll find the words are there. The Equal Justice Initiative held a remembrance for George Ward on March 1st of this year. That was just three months ago. Members of his family came to Terre Haute, to the banks of the Wabash, to the place of his murder, for reconciliation as part of the National Community Remembrance Project. At a time when some are eager to protect certain symbols of our history, they would rather lynching, redlining, and other manifestations of racism go unremembered. But a grace given without regard to our substance, to the weight of our commitment to one another, is indeed the cheapest of grace the grace we are invited into of being the neighbor, to sacrifice our own welfare for those who are suffering is far more costly. But it is quite literally the substance of the gospel. Jesus has given a mandate to those who would be his disciples. Shepherd the shepherdless when all around are wolves. This mandate is, at its root, political. And yet, even if we wish to avoid it, it remains, calling out to us to be with. The words will come. Trust that the words will come. Just be with these sheep as he is with us. An unconditional love for unconditional loving. 
this is what it means to be his disciples committed to loving the evil out of this world not papering over it or ignoring it hoping it will go away or saying nothing to avoid angering the protectors of injustice saying the names of victims revealing their stories seeking better justice than what we're doing now in this house and we can transform this community this city once the site of a most heinous evil an evil protected for decades by banks civic leaders and even the church and we can turn it into a place of true conciliation god's kingdom with our healing presence and our love for unconditional loving O oh god our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble in this challenging and uncertain time of global pandemic and public health crisis we come before you offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church and the world. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and serve as a beacon of hope to a suffering world. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Jennifer, our bishop, and all who minister in your name. Lord, in your mercy, For all affected by the coronavirus around the world, for the leaders of the nations, that they may work together for a common good as the outbreak spreads. May barriers that divide be brought down, that bonds of trust may be strengthened to benefit the entire human family. Lord, in your mercy. Grant public health and government officials in our nation the strength and will to act swiftly and decisively with wisdom and compassion in service to all. We pray especially for our president, the Congress, governors, and elected officials in local municipalities. Lord, in your mercy, Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to all who are caring for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy. For healthcare workers who are with hearts of service stand on the front lines of providing care, Grant them courage and protection as they put the needs of public safety before their own. Lord, in your mercy. Bless scientists and researchers around the world as they combat the virus, that their work may yield knowledge to develop a vaccine, treatments, and improved measures to reduce its spread. Lord, in your mercy. For the safety and well-being of all who travel and those who remain quarantined, Lord, in your mercy. Remove the presence of fear and anxiety from our hearts, that confident in your providence we may be generous in sharing our resources. Lord, in your mercy. Grant that our churches and communities of faith may reflect your love as they minister to the most vulnerable among us. Fill them with your Holy Spirit as they work to be your healing hands and feet to all in need. Lord, in your mercy.
for those who have already lost loved ones to the virus and those who will yet suffer such loss that they may know the consolation of your love lord in your mercy for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and those whose faith is known to you alone that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief but life eternal lord in your mercy in the anglican cycle of prayer we pray for the church of the province of myanmar or burma and this month in this diocese we pray for waycross camp and conference center its director camp counselors staff and campers we pray for trinity lawrenceburg we pray for the diocese of brasilia haiti and south sudan we pray for our parish neighbors centenary united methodist church central presbyterian church united campus ministries and second christian church we pray for those who are celebrating their birthdays Edward Bryan and Megan Streeter. We pray for those celebrating their baptismal anniversaries, including Linda Earhart and David Nearpass. We pray for those celebrating their marriage anniversaries, Martha and Don Layton, Keeley and Sam Floyd, Gail and Don Nat Kemper, and Debbie and Alan Veach. We pray for our postulant, Joanna Benskin. And we pray for those who have asked for our prayers, Sheila Carl, Sally Newlin, Ray Snyder, Linda Hegedus, Robin Rolt, Megan Price, Richard Hillier, Johnny Western, Terry Persinger, John Bonner, Lane Clark, Martha Hafner, Ellie Thomas, Mike Hayden, Jason Paradowski, Ashley Ritchie, Joe Kuhn, Justin Mendoza, Aaron Campbell. Are there others? Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick. And lift up all who are brought low. That we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
pray as one. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as I proclaim your resurrection. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord of the feast, we thank you for gathering as us as your people. We call to remembrance the many times we have been fed at your table, and we lament our distance now. Be present, Lord Jesus, as you were present with your disciples. Be known to us in the breaking of the bread, and may your Holy Spirit Sustain us and all your church until we can gather together again. We ask this for the sake of your love. Amen. God's blessing be with you. Christ's peace be with you. The Spirit's outpouring be with you, now and always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.